Everything shook on Wednesday of this week. Things once considered rock solid shifted before us. When that happens, it's been my experience that it causes us to ask fundamental questions. Questions like, who are we? Where does our identity come from? And where is our identity leading us? And not just on a national level, but on an individual level too. Whenever I think of the question of my identity, I'm always drawn back to my baptism, which connects me directly to Jesus' baptism, which connects me directly to something. Remembering what that something is, is the critical purpose of today's message. Would you pray with me? Lord God Almighty, let the meditations of our minds and the words of my mouth be holy and acceptable to you as we come to encounter your living word and hear it impact our lives. In your holy name we pray, amen. Whenever you read the story of Jesus' baptism, have you ever wondered, why do you wait so long? I mean, based on the information from other gospels, we're pretty certain it was a 30-year-old Jesus who came to the water's edge. It's the babe born in the manger, but it's 30 years later before Jesus begins his earthly ministry. Some people on earth knew he was in the world for 30 years. A family knew, shepherds knew, some wise men knew, the king of Judea once knew, some people in the temple knew, but Jesus doesn't begin his ministry for 30 years. Why? Well, there's a lot of theories and a lot of stories out there as to why, but at the end of the day, we really don't know why. I love one cultural explanation that has been offered. It centers on Joseph, husband of Mary. The last reference to Joseph in the story that Luke gives us is of the 12-year-old Jesus teaching in the temple. After that, the stories only refer to Mary. There's no more reference to Joseph. Did he die? We don't know. But if he did, and there were adult male children, then the Jewish custom of that day would be that the widowed mother was the responsibility of the firstborn son until he would be 30 years old. Then the responsibility could be passed to other younger sons if they could earn a living. We know Jesus had several other siblings, including brothers, and we know Jesus would have been the oldest son because of the virgin birth story. But the truth is, it's all speculation. We really just don't know. Especially since it appears that it was the actions of John the baptizer that seemed to set in motion Jesus literally walking into his true identity. Personally, though, I got to tell you, I like the image of Jesus taking care of mom first, handing that responsibility off to his younger adult siblings when they're ready, and then leaving home to go save the world. <laughs> it's just the perfect union of humanity and divinity given the way Jesus came into the world. But however it happened, the starting gun did not seem to be raised by Jesus. Instead, it was by a weird man doing weird things in a weird place. <laughs> the weird man I'm referring to was John. The weird thing was baptizing Jewish people. And the weird place was a specific wilderness place. So how did John become the trigger pole on the starting gun, initiating a 30-year-old Jesus' ministry on earth? Well, the writer of Mark gives us some clues. Look to the prophets. The answer lies back in the prophetic stories that the children of God have been telling for hundreds of years. Stories of God showing up through leaders named Moses and Joshua, freeing a captive people and leading them through the wilderness into the promised land. Stories of powerful prophets like Elijah, who took on the prophets of a false god and the Jewish king's foreign wife Jezebel, who had made worship of that false god the new unwelcome center of Israel's religious life. Moses, Joshua, Elijah, all men of God who were tied to a particular piece of real estate, the River Jordan Wilderness just north of the Dead Sea, Gilgal, Jericho, Mount Nebo, all just a few miles apart, all tied directly to God's story, 
all specific landmarks of a wilderness place where God showed up in the past. And this was the very place where John started to make some noise, doing some weird attention-getting things. In campfire stories told for generations, the children of God were told Elijah never died. Instead, he handed his mantle over to Elisha at the parting of the River Jordan in this specific wilderness place and was taken up into heaven in a chariot of fire. Now that's the kind of story that dances with the flames of a campfire as it's being told, especially when it's paired with the prophetic words of Malachi. Malachi ends his prophecy with this concept. You know, the world, it just doesn't seem fair right now, but a different day is coming because the God of righteousness, the God of justice, demands that it will all be right one day. And through Malachi, God said it this way, And lo, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Probably a great day for those anticipating, and probably a terrible day for those who ignore him. Which is why the clarion call went out from that very area where Elijah was taken up, in that very area where the children originally crossed into the promised land, in that very wilderness place, as John began to look a lot like Elijah, a hairy man wearing a leather belt, as John began to act a lot like Elijah, a simple man who lived off whatever the land provided, and as John began to sound a lot like Elijah, Repent and turn back to God. That was Elijah's core message. You can see why. It became possible to see the weird man doing weird things in a weird place as Elijah. It's all happening as foretold. It's a calling to prepare the way for the one to come. It's happening where it should, how it should. It appeared the starting gun just went off. But this act of baptism... What was that? The truth is, <laughs> we've been trying to understand it fully for 2,000 years now. A form of baptism is known to the Jewish culture to this day. It's part of the final ritual of bringing someone not born Jewish into the Jewish faith. But Jewish people born into the faith, like those responding to John's call from Jerusalem, they don't need to experience baptism unless... It's somehow understood as a completely new identity. What we know is the people went into the wilderness in droves where God had moved before to prepare themselves for God to move again. And John is making it very clear that preparation will require a new identity through the water. And as the people of Jerusalem begin in mass in that specific wilderness place where God had moved before, a 30-year-old Jesus from Nazareth appears. He comes, not as Mary's son. He comes to take on his identity. Now, we don't know what conversations took place between Jesus and Mary as he prepared to leave her. We don't know what conversations took place between Jesus and his siblings as he prepared to leave them. But what we do know is that according to Mark, John expected his arrival. And John already knew the one to come would cleanse people with something more powerful than water. It would be a cleansing spirit. That sets up the pivotal scene as a 30-year-old Jesus enters the water with John. And in that sacred moment, Mark uniquely, uniquely records the heavens were torn apart as Jesus is baptized. That reminds me of the scene at the end of Mark's story where Mark says at Jesus' death on the cross, the temple curtain separating the holy of holies from the people is torn apart from top to bottom, from on high to down low, just to be clear where this movement is coming from. I think we're supposed to see Jesus as the one ripping down the boundary between heaven and earth, tearing apart the very things that separate us from God. And in that tearing, a part of heaven spills out onto Jesus. Mark says it is the Spirit descending like a dove as God speaks those words affirming Jesus' true identity. You are my Son, the Beloved, with you. I am well pleased. 
what spilled out of heaven in that sacred moment initiated his earthly ministry. It was his true revealed identity in the household of God. It was the start of all things being made new again. You know, Wednesday of this week caused me to think of my baptism. Roughly 60 years ago, a mommy and a daddy stood in a Methodist church at the water's edge with a baby boy. A pastor asked the question, what name is given this child in the household of God? My dad and my mom said out loud for God and everyone present to hear, Mark Lawrence Burgess. I was baptized that day through two actions. First, I was touched by the water of life that connects all of us to each other and to God. As the pastor said, Mark Lawrence Burgess, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And second, I was touched by the others present and the Holy Spirit, as the pastor said, may the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born through both water and spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. That was the moment in our Methodist understanding that God adopted me into the household of God. I became a Christian in that moment, not by anything I did, but by everything God has done. I was given identity and purpose through the Spirit of God that would be revealed through a life cooperating with God's grace, a life ultimately given to God's will as I would later come into life-giving relationship with God through Jesus Christ. I was adopted through God's half of the covenant promise. And all those present on that day in the congregation 60 years ago promised to share in that covenant promise to nurture me in the Christian faith so that I would one day be able to claim the faith that had already claimed me so I could walk boldly into my true God-given identity and my purpose in this broken world no matter what. And that spirit that pours out into us as we walk by faith in this world sustains us in all things. It sustains us in the good days, and it sustains us even on the I can't believe this is happening days. Who are you? Well, you're a child of God. Where does your true identity come from? Well, it comes from the one who created you. Where is your identity leading you? Well, it's leading you to a life full of grace, both in this world and in the next. That's what's inside us, the spirit of God's grace. That's what drives us, the spirit of God's grace. That's what sustains us, the spirit of God's grace. That's what we need to remember when the world shakes. You have more strength inside of you than you will ever need. And the good news of this day, it doesn't come from you. It comes from God. So at the intersection of baptism of the Lord week, and a week of earth-shaking images. I hope you hear God saying, remember my children, you are baptized and be thankful. And just so you have new images in your mind's eye of God still moving among the people of God, I'm gonna invite you now to join with us in witnessing the recent baptism of little Gracie Emerson as she is brought to the water's edge to receive her God-given identity, beginning her journey towards the heart of God. Hey family, it's a joy to have you with us as we come to the water's edge. There's just something special and wonderful about coming to the water's edge to watch God move through a baptism. We have the Emerson family with us today. That's Ben and Kelsey, that's dad and mom. And we have big brother Liam here as well. And the one, yeah, and the one who's being baptized is Gracie. And we're just so glad that you could be a part of this with us. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the spirit. All of this is God's gift offered to us without price. 
mom and dad in our United Methodist understanding of baptism, we believe that this baptismal covenant is shared with the family and the faith community. So we ask you to affirm the faith this child will be raised in by answering these three very significant questions. First, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? Second, do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? And third, do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and put your whole trust in His grace and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to all people? If so, would you say, we do? We do. Family, we ask you this. Will you nurture this child in Christ's holy church that by your teaching and example, she may be guided to accept God's grace for herself to profess her faith openly and to lead a Christian life? In congregation, we ask you, Will you love this child and do everything in your power to nurture them in our shared Christian faith? If so, where you are at this very moment, please say, with God's help, we will. With God's help, we will. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for transforming our lives through the living water of Jesus. Let your Holy Spirit make this water holy so that as Gracie is baptized with it, she will inwardly experience the power of the Holy Spirit and begin to live a new and abundant life. Amen. Gracie, Gracie, what a joy. I just love coming to this time. Oh, I do. It's one of my favorite things to do, and I know you're a water bug too, so you're going to enjoy this. Mom, Dad, I ask you, what name is given this child in the household of God? Emma Grace. Emma Grace Emerson. I baptize you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And let the church say, Amen. Amen. Emma, may the Holy Spirit work within you. That being born both of water and spirit, you may grow to be a beloved disciple of Jesus Christ. And let the church say, Amen. Amen. This is that time when normally, Gracie, this is that time that normally I would take you in my arms and I'd walk you all over the church and we'd introduce you to everybody. Yeah, it would be so cool, but we're just not going to do that right now. Instead, though, I want to remind everyone, you're part of this holy covenant that God is performing in this moment, this sacred moment. And I just ask you, faith family, will you do everything in your power? to continue to love this child, nurture this child, teach this child the faith that she's been raised in. And I know that you just want to say, yes, we do. We just, this is a part of the amazing covenant that God is doing in this holy moment. So Gracie, I celebrate with you in this critical, wonderful, absolutely amazing moment. And I know you're just wanting to celebrate, aren't you? Through baptism, we are incorporated by the Holy Spirit into God's new creation and made to share in Christ's royal priesthood. We are all one in Christ Jesus. With all of our joy and thanksgiving, we welcome you, Gracie, and your family into the body of Christ, the family of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Yay. Awesome.